from Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, whales, sharks, and bees. What do these three creatures have in common? The answer to that question? All of them are under threat. Endangered whales getting hit by container ships, sharks dying on hooks intended for other fish, and bees, well, we all know bees are getting clobbered by pesticides and, of course, climate change. But they've got something else in common, too. In each case, entrepreneurs or scientists are testing new ways to use artificial intelligence and other technologies to try to protect these species from harm. Let's go from big to small and start with whales. My colleague Todd Woody writes about the environment for Bloomberg Green, and he's here with me from San Francisco to tell us about a project that warns ship captains when they're on a collision course with giant underwater mammals. Todd, you've written about this new technology called WhaleSafe which is intended to stop giant container ships from hitting and killing whales. I have to admit, I didn't know that this was a big problem. How big a problem is it? For endangered whales, ship strikes are one of the leading causes of death. So it's a huge problem, particularly because, for instance, blue whales, their migratory patterns and routes cross major global shipping lanes. Scientists aren't quite sure, but whales tend to feed in certain spots. They may not hear the ship or the noise, you know, might drown out their ability to get out of the way. Definitely, it's a major issue. Where's the worst place in the world for this? Where does this happen the most? It's a global problem. I don't know if there's one particular place that's worse than others. A study that came out in recent years tracked or mapped migration patterns for whales across the world, and it really did show that they coincide with the major shipping lanes. So how does whale safe work? How does it actually protect the whales? It's operating in two locations, one in the Santa Barbara Channel, which is a major blue whale feeding ground and also a major superhighway for ships heading toward Los Angeles and also off the coast of San Francisco. And what they do is they place a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone, out in the ocean, which can detect whale vocalizations. It's a whale song. Eat whale songs. And so that data is beamed to computer servers somewhere, and artificial intelligence program you know, matches it against a library of tens of thousands of other whale sounds to identify the type of species. And once that species is identified and located, it beams that information to ship captains so they can take action like slowing down. And so are all the shipping companies now tied into this network? It's a totally voluntary program, but I think around 60% have agreed to use this information off California. And since they implemented this, has there actually been a drop in the number of whales that are being struck by these ships? The program is only a couple of years old, but in Santa Barbara, the first full year, it was an operation. They did show a drop in ship strikes. Scientists say it's too early to say if you know this is the causal effect, but they say it's good news nonetheless. One thing you write in your story, which I found really fascinating, is that because whales are so depleted after many, many years of their populations falling, that even just one whale that's killed can have a huge effect on the future survival of the species. Yes, particularly with blue whales. There's only like I think 1.2 whales per year in certain areas would affect the sustainability of the species. We only recover the bodies of a very tiny portion of whales that are hit by ships. Most are hit in the open ocean and they sink to the bottom of the ocean. So scientists basically have to estimate how many are killed each year. Todd, you also write about how important whales are to limiting the effects of climate change. Got to say, that was a surprising one to me. How do they do that? Yes, it's still a developing science, but scientists have quantified how much carbon whales absorb, sequester in their bodies, which are huge. And when they die, that carbon, their bodies sink to the bottom of the ocean where it's sequestered. But probably a bigger impact is when they poop, they spawn big phytoplankton blooms. And phytoplankton sequester some 37 billion tons of CO2 every year. Top predators like whales and sharks are not just important because they're sort of charismatic creatures we like to see, but they're vital to keeping ocean ecosystems healthy because they regulate predator-prey populations. 
all the things that we're talking about here kind of point to a sort of urgent need for action when it comes to just protecting biodiversity in oceans to keep things from becoming severely imbalanced, losing species that play important roles. There have been any number of international efforts, including by the UN, to try to protect marine life. How is that going? We don't actually hear about it all that much with so many other things happening in the world. Since 2018, delegates to the United Nations have been negotiating a treaty to protect the biodiversity of the high seas that would be accomplished mainly by creating marine protected areas and requiring environmental impact assessments of potentially harmful activities in international waters. The treaty was supposed to be finalized in 2022, but agreement could not be reached. The next and supposedly final negotiating session begins February 20th. And you talk about the high seas, I mean, we think this kind of romantic pirates on the high seas, but that's actually a term. What are the high seas? The high seas are the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So area of the ocean that's beyond the 200 mile limit of country's exclusive economic zone. And what would this agreement, if they're able to reach one, what would actually do? What are the provisions in it? One of the main provisions that would help conserve species would be it would allow the creation of marine protected areas on the high seas. So areas where fishing could be banned, where other harmful activities could be banned. The other aspect would be requiring these environmental impact assessments. So before, say, some big fishing operation or some extractive operation could be done, you would have to do an assessment to see what the impact would be on marine species in the area. And do you think it's likely that We're going to see an agreement, seeing how it keeps getting pushed back. They're very close on a lot of things. There's some other aspects of the treaty that are more controversial, that sort of hung up negotiations. So it was supposed to be done in 2020, but the pandemic pushed that back. They met last March in 2022. That was supposed to be the final negotiating session. They did not reach agreement. They met again in August, did not reach agreement. So there's really, there's a lot of pressure on to wrap this thing up in February and March of this year. Given the lack of action by international organizations and governments of the world, it seems like the things we're talking about here are companies and scientists stepping in to fill the need. Are there other examples of companies or scientists kind of employing new technologies, AI and other sorts of things to help? Yes, there's one very simple technology that's been put out there for experimenting that seems to work. It's LED lights that are attached to fishing lines, and that has been shown to deter sea turtles. So all seven of the world's sea turtle species are endangered. So these are like lights. For some reason, it makes the sea turtles stay away from the nets. Is there a lot of investment in this? Are companies putting money into developing these technologies, or is it just very expensive and it's difficult to profit from it? Right now, it's mainly scientists who are developing these technologies. I would say there's not a, you know, not a private investment, but ocean companies do have an interest in lowering the uh, impact on marine species. I mean, for instance, it's not a good look when a cruise ship steams into port with an endangered whale wrapped around its bow, which happened in Southern California a couple of years ago. So there's definitely an interest for them to, you know, for instance, like for the whale safe, to sign up for those alerts. We'll be right back. Todd, you've written another story about a company in the UK that's trying to come up with a solution to what's called shark bycatch. That's when sharks are caught on hooks that are intended for other fish. It's this device called Shark Guard. What exactly is it? So it's a small cylinder device. It's attached to fishing hooks for like long, long line tuna vessels, which will deploy like miles and miles of fishing hooks. And it emits an electric field that sharks can sense and it repels them because they want to stay away from that field. Our producer, Federica Romaniello, went to visit Fish Tech Marine, the company that invented Shark Guard, to see how it's made. I'm in Devon, and I'm here with Pit Keeble. He is the co-founder of Fish Tech Marine and the managing director of the company. The other co-founder of the company is his brother, Ben Kibble. One of the things that you are trying to put out in the market is something called Shark Guard, and you're holding the fourth prototype, you were saying, right? Yes, that's right. So this is number four, hopefully the final prototype. So after this, well, we're, we're now currently working on the sort of final commercial version, if you like. So this uh, device, the Shark Guard, 
generates a electric pulse every couple of seconds, generates an electric sort of field uh, around the baited hook. The sharks are extremely sensitive to electric currents, uh, thousands of times more sensitive to electric fields than say teleost fish, things like tuna, herring, cod, etc. So the device just literally clips in. This prototype shark guard has a small lithium battery and it's designed to last for, I think it's about 60 to 70 hours of pulsing. 60 to 70 hours is six to seven days of fishing, which typically could be a, a fishing trip if they're going out, a day or two steaming, fishing for a week and then steaming back. The holder is, is fitted on the, the branch line when they're rigging the gear and the shark guard can be removed when you need to replace a battery. Let's describe the actual shark guard itself. It's a fairly small, maybe 10, 15 centimeter cylinder with copper. I think they're bronze, these um, electrodes, um, and these are sort of positive, negative, sort of creating the, the electric field. In a clear tube, and you can see the drive circuit here, capacitor, battery, etc. So that's uh, detecting when it's in the water and then activating every couple of seconds, it generates a, a 30, 40 volt pulse. Uh, and that's what deters the sharks. And how does that work? How does it deter sharks? Why are sharks deterred by say tuna or what people want to fish is not deterred? So sharks have a system of electroreceptors, um, ampullae of Lorenzini, tiny little pits around the snout and the mouth of the shark. And uh, they use this to detect, for example, the tiny electric currents generated by fish, by prey. So whenever muscle twitches or muscle moves, you've got your neurons, your nerve cells that activate the muscle, you get these, these tiny little currents generated. And the sharks developed a very, very sensitive system of electroreceptors, so it can detect the currents that are generated by prey. So sharks have a detection threshold, if you like, where they can detect the electric field and it might actually attract them. Above a certain voltage field strength, if you like, then it deters them. It's too strong, too powerful. So a bit like, you know, our ears, for example, are designed for picking up sound, you know, communicating, you know, speech, etc. They're quite sensitive organs. If someone's yelling in our ear, it's not very comfortable, so we tend to move away. So the shark's got a very sensitive uh, organ system, if you like, these electro um, sensors, receptors. But if they're overstimulated, it gets to a point where it's uncomfortable, so they'll move away from that uh, field. There was a study conducted in cooperation with the University of Exeter, which is not too far away from here. What did the study find? So the shark guards were deployed in a, a commercial French um, bluefin tuna fishery in the Mediterranean. The fishery has, I, I think there are about 40, 50 vessels active in the fishery, and they do have an issue with blue shark and pelagic ray uh, cartilaginous fish, so in the same family as sharks, if you like. So we trial it in the fishery, uh, two commercial vessels, um, 500 shark guards, 500 um, control hooks, if you like, without shark guards. The results were, were pretty, pretty astonishing. So we had a, over 90% reduction in blue shark bycatch and uh, about a 70% reduction in pelagic ray bycatch. And do you anticipate a lot of uptake in terms of companies that might be interested in this? There will probably be relatively few fishers that would willingly uh, kit them, their vessels out with a shark guard system. I think the big driver here though is going to be the massive push for shark conservation. So at the moment, the pelagic fleets are supplying tuna and swordfish to supermarkets around the world. Now there's a significant shark bycatch issue associated with every kilo of tuna and swordfish that are uh, uh, essentially derived from pelagic longline operations. So my feeling is that if those longline fleets that are currently interacting with sharks want to carry on supplying your kind of top shelf supermarkets with all the environmental social corporate drivers, they're going to have to improve their act in terms of reducing shark bycatch. And I would hope that over the next few years that starts to manifest and we start to see more uptake of these you know, of, of shark guard systems in these vessels. 
Todd, we've just heard how tech could potentially save sharks from being killed each year. Why is it so important to protect sharks? Since 1970, scientists estimate that shark populations have fallen 70%, and they estimate around 100 million sharks are killed each year. Often, they're killed by being entangled or ensnared in fishing lines. It's a huge issue because sharks, again, like whales, are top predators in the ocean. Todd Woody, thanks so much for talking with me. Thank you. When we come back from sea to air, can technology help save honeybees? So we talked about tech solutions to help save whales and sharks. Now we're going to talk about bees. I'm joined now by my colleague, Coco Liu, in New York. Coco, you've written a story about a company called Bee Flow, which is helping to restore bee populations. Could you tell us what this company does? Bee Flow is a California-based startup, and then it uses biotechnology to help bees survive under the current threat and also help the remaining bee population to pollinate the right crops as a way to help farmers increase their crop output. The way to do is it has two types of supplements. So one thing I learned from the reporting is that honeybees actually don't do very well in cold weather. Its performance drops significantly when the temperature is cold. Just like humans take a supplement to boost its immune system, bee flows create the supplements using plant-based ingredients to help honeybees also boost their immune system so they can keep working even though the temperature is, uh, is low. So they essentially feed the bees this kind of like vitamin boost supplement to get their energy up? It's kind of like that. So it's a kind of a supplement. What the company is trying to achieve. So one is to give this extra nutrition or the nutrition that the bees are miss, currently missing because of the loss of habitat. So bees can, you know, survive better in under the current environment. And another thing is they have a second supplement, which is kind of like a memory conditioning supplement. The way it uh, works is when we smell flower, we just smell flower, but that smell actually contains different signals to different animals. So scientists at uh, bee flow do is to find the right signal that talks to honeybees. And then they create a supplement with that signal. Whenever they feed the, uh, this supplement to the bees and the bees are exposed to the smell of the flower, they give the honeybees a sugar syrup. Honeybees are trained to associate that smell with the food. So whenever the bees go out to the field, they will just actively, you know, seek that smell rather than being lured away by wild flowers. By doing so, it kind of increases the efficiency of honeybee pollination for agriculture. This is an attempt to try to increase the bee population, increase, I guess, bee productivity given the current threat. Can you talk just a little bit about what that threat is? Like, why do we need this? Basically, what has happened in the past two decades and will probably unfortunately continue to happen is that the global bee population has declined significantly worldwide. And then that was caused by a combination of factors like uh, the loss of habitats and the use of pesticides and, of course, climate change. Honeybees usually don't do very well in cold weather, so the extreme cold slaps could kill off our bees. Why is it so important now to protect bees from cold weather? Why is that a problem now when it wasn't a problem before? We have seen an increase in extreme weather events, so that makes it most important for us to take action now. China recently got hit by a uh, record low temperature in North China. And then we have seen that uh, in other parts of uh, California and then other, and Europe as well. So all of those uh, extreme weather events will affect the survival of bees, including honeybees. You have found in your reporting that there's actually a correlation between a drop in honeybees and sort of a drop in pollination and deaths. So one recent study found that uh, insufficient pollination is causing about 500,000 early deaths a year around the world. The way to think about it is that, uh, you know, if we don't have 
bees to pollinate the plants that we we eat, then our diet would be forced to change, and then the loss of nutrition would affect our health. If all the honeybees died for good, disappeared for good, humans probably wouldn't、uh, go extinct. But、uh, it's about the change of our diet and the loss of nutrition we need to keep our healthy and have a long life and better quality of life. Are beekeepers around the world looking at similar sorts of things to help their own bee populations? I mean, how big is the worldwide push to conserve bees? I think it's a global move. Bee Flow is just one company offering, you know, a service to honeybees survival. There are also other companies, like there is a startup in Europe that provide a in-hive a smart sensor for beekeepers. Basically, the idea is if there is something out of normal in the beehive, the company will send an alert to beekeepers to intervene before it's too late. So that's another way to help bees survive in this environment. And then I know a U.S. startup. Is also developing vaccines for bees against the deadly disease, and、uh, I think both in UK and、uh, Russia there are companies doing the so-called early warning system, because you know the pesticide distribution is a huge issue for the survival of bees. But、uh, as a beekeeper, how do you know the farm next to you? Will spray、uh, pesticides. So there are internet companies collecting data from farmers and then send an alert to beekeepers to say, "Hey guys, you probably want to move your hive because they're going to spread pesticide in the next hour." Coco Lu, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. You can read more from Todd Woody and Coco Lu on Bloomberg.com. Thanks for listening to us here at the Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeart Radio. For more shows from iHeart Radio, visit the iHeart Radio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to Big Take at Bloomberg dot net. The supervising producer of the Big Take is Vicky Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producer is Federica Romaniello. Our associate producer is Zenab Sadiki. Hilda Garcia is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kasova. We'll be back tomorrow with another big take.